Hello, dear colleagues. We're at Uroonco 24 in Budapest, and with me is Dr. Ursula Volk from Bellisona, Switzerland. And today we're talking about many things on genomic profiling, IPARPs, and toxicities and how to handle them. So my first question to Ursula is about genomic profiling. We have seen that PARP inhibition has come to stay in urological tumors. We have seen the evolution of using these drugs from the metastatic castration resistance setting and now with trials that will come in the future in the hormone sensitive setting. So Ursula, what are your comments on this? What is coming in the next in the next years or in the next months for urology regarding IPARP inhibition? Well, I think the main thing you already mentioned, I mean, we have the drugs available, we have positive trials. So mainly in monotherapy, in MCRPC, after one AR targeted agent, we have excellent data from Profound. So we should be ready and know which patient to treat. So first thing, as, as you mentioned, is testing. So we should have the test results ready in MCRPC latest and mainly by tissue, so somatic testing. But if you have uh, the availability also to do germline testing or vice versa, the best thing is to do both. But we have to know if the patient is eligible for a PARP inhibitor and we know that they can have excellent responses. You, you have tackled an uh, interesting thing about somatic and germline mutations. What are the difference between them? What should I ask before? What should I ask later? You have told, you have told that you should act for both. Why is this? Well, we can miss uh, one or the other small percentage of potential alterations if we do one or the other test. Mainly is recommended to do somatic testing on tissue because there we have the mutations on the tumor. It doesn't mean that if you do germline testing and you don't find a mutation or alteration that there couldn't be any mutation also on tissue. So there has been a recent publication from the group of uh, Elena Castro and uh, Dr. Olmos that showed that you miss um, actually results if you do only germline but also vice versa in a small percentage you can miss them and if the patient is fit if I mean is applicable for, for applying a PARP inhibitor you have should have all the information but in general since access to testing in general is different and it's very heterogeneous in all over the world you go first step for somatic testing. How many patients do you expect to treat in the hormone sensitive setting with these drugs? <laughs> yeah so um, I think we will have the results of the trials that are ongoing um, in hom metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer around end of next year so we we have to prepare and i mean we know that that we have around five to ten percent of patients that need uh, pop inhibitors so that have uh, applicable mutations or alterations for the drug so this is what we have to expect you said a word now that is key for the next topic to be discussed is uh, the alterations needed to be treated. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that one size doesn't fit all. So what would be the alterations? I know that BRCA is very clear, but what about the other alterations that you can have? Mm -hmm. And if it's fit or not, this treatment for those patients? Absolutely. So, I mean, as you remember, in the beginning, the trials were designed in patients that had any a, a broad panel of uh, HRR alterations, so could be could have been also very rare uh, HRR mutations, and uh, actually subgroup analysis and looking deeper into also meta analysis of the trials showed that not all um, HRR uh, mutations bring a benefit when you apply a PARP inhibitor. And besides BRCA1 and 2, actually they found that also PALP B2 um, and CHECK2 can be something that uh, where patients might benefit, but small numbers. We're looking at very small numbers of patients in the trial that have those specific alterations. We have to uh, respect also approvals and uh, in, uh, by the label. So, so far we only have a label for BRCA1 and 2 in most countries. Great. So it's clear that all these treatments are migrating to the left, let's say, so we should be ready to handle them in clinics and by all the, the specialists that handle prostate cancer. So let's talk about toxicity. What are the toxicity expected with these treatments? Are there any difference between them? Because we have, nowadays we have three drugs. Do you see any difference between them in how to handle them and how to handle the, the toxicities? 
Absolutely. We have to be aware that all the enthusiasm besides the, the fantastic uh, response rates, it, PARP inhibitors are toxic drugs. Um, mainly they have some side effects as classic chemotherapy. So they have GI toxicity, nausea, diarrhea. We have to be aware that they do a lot of fatigue. Uh, but also hematological toxicity and uh, you have to be uh, have to prepare also for neutropenic fever uh, a lot of anemia and in rare cases also thromboembolic events not uh, to forget that there were about uh, four percent of thromboembolic events uh, in the trials with PARP inhibitors and there is a difference so um, uh, um, the olaparib tends to have less uh, hematotox so we have also about 20% grade 3 anemia, while in the Telapro 2 trial with telazoparib and enzalutamide, we've seen half of patients, so 50% having G3 anemia, which means that you have to do a dose reduction <clears throat> and react also uh, to those side effects. So you handle the side effects first with dose reduction. Yes. And after that, of course, tackling the different side effects, depending on, on, on what has been done, mm. right? Like diarrhea and so on. There's anything that we can do to prevent those side effects? Well, um, difficult as in chemotherapy, you know, we can give patients standby medication for nausea and for diarrhea. Um, but we have for the hematotox, we can only be uh, give good information to the patient when they have fever that they have to present immediately and we have to check them up very regularly. So actually in the label, it's recommended to check patients uh, in the beginning, even weekly or then bi-weekly uh, for a blood test. When, when the patient is coming to clinics, if it's coming so shortly, what do you ask in the blood test or what do you see in the physical sign of the patients? Mm -hmm. Well, um, anemia can lead uh, to the need of transfusion, stopping drug, uh, maybe you need to apply growth factors. So the blood test is fundamental, at least in the beginning of, of the PARP inhibitors. Once you establish the drug, you know if the patient is more um, is having a, a risk for, for the hematotox, uh, but it's including also lab work up when you see the patient. But then of course, seeing if the patient has severe fatigue, um, quality of life issues, and also the diarrhea aspect. But most toxicity is uh, seen on the blood test. Do you think that these toxicities increase with the combination therapies? Well, uh, they don't really overlap. Let's say when we saw the trials, uh, mainly combining with abiraterone and salutamide. The only thing that is overlapping is fatigue. Um, other side effects are class specific, so there's no overlap between them. Well, thank you very much, Ursula, for your insights in, in handling toxicities with these drugs. Any last message that you want to, to deliver? I think it's important actually that since we have those fantastic drugs um, that we we can give them to the patients and know to whom select best as you mentioned the one size doesn't fit all and so everything goes back to testing and also to testing in the right setting thank you very much for being with us today and thank you for the listeners to this video